goes on. So, all right. Hey, everybody. It's Uncle Matt. This is Uncle Matt's D&D Neighborhood. And today um, I have with me Brendan LaSalle. Brendan, say hello to your fans. Hello. How you doing? And um, just want to remind everybody, uh, in terms of boosting the channel, if you would please like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, if you're feeling rich, uh, you can give to the Patreon that we have at uh, patreon.com slash Uncle Matt. And uh, with that quick intro, uh, we're going to go into uh, the topic for tonight's live broadcast, uh, which is Brendan's five top DM tips. We had a great show with Jim Wampler. And so I'm going to pull in uh, some other people to give their five uh, top five DM tips. Um, Brendan uh, works for Goodman Games. And so his DMing at conventions uh, is actually professional. Um, so you're hearing tips from a, a, a true pro. And um, the the tips that he's going to give are going to sort of focus more on convention games. So, Brendan, you want to uh, expand on that a little bit? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, because I'm repping for Goodman, like 99% of my gaming these days is convention stuff. Um, I was uh, just telling Matt, um, I, I recently I've started with a new group here in Salem, Massachusetts. And uh, we managed to like get four sessions in of a DCC campaign, which now means that's the longest camp actual campaign that I've run in more than five years. Um, because I'm always I do conventions and then I do a lot of play testing, so I'm almost always running one shots. Um, in some cases, going back to the same group with the same adventure to do it two or three times before I take it on the road. So um, I guess the uh, the first question to ask then is rather you know before we get on to uh the dm tips which i know that everyone is going to want to get into um but uh so uh, what sort of games is it that you run at conventions because when we did the one with jim wampler the chat room exploded with get brendan uh on the show next so uh well um okay so um I would say about right, you know, in, in this calendar year past, about seventy percent of what I ran was regular dungeon crawl classics. Um, I ran so um, fan fantasy games for yes, percent. Okay, fantasy games for DCC, mm -hmm. and um, I ran um, all. I mean, it, you know, homebrew, but a lot of them are adventures that either have been published or that I'm working on publishing at some point. You know, um, and then. The rest of that was all my game, X Crawl. Um, I've been um, running at, like um, I don't know if you know X Crawl, but that's that's my, my personal game. Um, mm -hmm. I've been um, publishing that one since 2002, and it originally came out in a version for um, third edition, and then 3.5. Uh, we did a Pathfinder edition a few years back, and now I'm working on the Dungeon Crawl Classics conversion for that, and I've been doing that um, uh pretty much exclusively at like conventions you know now for the last couple of years so um i've been doing you know uh, uh, x crawl is a uh, uh, modern day fantasy gaming so the idea is that um it is you know your 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 dungeons and dragons world has grown up and become the modern media saturated world and um now you know you know nostalgic look back they run art they create artificial dungeons and run professional adventurers through who go in with like like NASCAR style, you know, um, sponsorship packages and um, with, you know, sometimes cheerleaders and the whole nine yards going through <laughs> fully lethal dungeons that are, you know, depending on the DJ, the dungeon judge that actually sets them up. Um, some of them are more like traditional dungeons. Some of them are more like lethal game shows. Um, but it's the main, um, it's the main sort of entertainment of the, the world out there. Um, so I've been doing that, like I said, since about 2002. And um, so I do, I, you know, I run a lot of X-Crawl as well. All right, awesome. Let's get on to your tips for DMing. Um, what's your first, and, and I tell people, I, I do not know what these are gonna be. So uh, what's, your, what's the first one? I'm gonna You're, write it well, down. You, you know, it was hard. Um, I watched your show with um, Jim Wampler uh, the other night. I'm a huge fan of Jim. And uh, Jim and I are kind of like spiritual brothers in we have, like, as far as GMing goes. like. We, we we sat for a long time in California at multiple things just talking about GMing strategy. We're we're really you know we're very much like this as far as our styles go. So I had to think beyond the stuff that I would have talked about. But I thought a couple of things that were important to mention, and you know 
in some ways it will go over what you got you spoke about with Jim, but in some ways it'll be different. And I tried to get some minute things. So um, one of the key things I think is um, subsume your ego. Um, don't get your ego wrapped up in how well your monsters do against your players. I think it's a bad mindset to approach the game with. And I think that's how I did it when I was a kid. And I felt when I was really young and running, you know, AD and D for my friends and through clever play or through good luck, I would see my players, you know, uh, do too well at my, you know what I'm saying? They would, they would do what I thought would be too good of a job doing what um, you know, they were doing, I would get frustrated personally and I would take that as an affront and I would be like, well, I got to get them back. So that that would sometimes, like I said, when I was a kid, that would lead me to bad gameplay. Like, like lead me to kind of like taking my little revenges out, revenges out on my groups and such. Um, so I think if you're going to be in a, you know, especially if you're doing con the convention circuit like I do, just don't get your ego wrapped up in uh, your how well your monsters do or how many players you kill. Um, if, if you need that kind of, you know, the, the reinforcement for your ego should be come from um, should come from how much fun your table is having. You know, that's to me, fun at the table is the only law. And um, I want to that's what I, you know, I, you know, if, if everyone's had a good time, then I feel like I've done a good job. And uh, if everyone's like sitting around like blah, then I feel like I failed. And um, that's what. Um, you know, I, I think you can get wrapped up in, well, I really wanted to, to, to pound them. There's a lot of players. They're smart. They're clever. They're going to come up with things you haven't thought of. And uh, I think it can be, you know, I think to to get upset at players doing what you hope that they will do in a game, I think will wreck your brain and uh, make you a worse GM. So I think the, you know, now the flip side of that is at the table, I never act that way. At the table, I always take act like I'm taking it personally. Oh, you roll another 20. How can you do that? And such? Yeah. Now, we had an interesting discussion about that with Jim. Um, and uh, I think it was with Jim. Yeah, it was with it was with Jim. And we yeah. had the chat room answering was the uh, uh, the fact that younger um, generations and with my white beard now, I think I can say that without anybody thinking that I'm talking down to them uh, in younger generations. Um, that has become less of a standard practice. Um, in terms of the way that people DM, but at a convention, of course, uh, you know, since we are older and, uh, you know, people are looking for that kind of a thing, uh, when they, when they pick a DM, uh, I, I think that that sort of trash talk with the players is, uh, uh, more, uh, more valid than it would be in a, in a home campaign. No, I, I think that's accurate, and I think that um, I, I think that it's always good fun to do around the table. And X crawl is made for it. You know what I mean? X crawl. I have my monsters trash talking, and sometimes referees and reporters and things in the background of the game. You know, um, but I never. It's never from the heart. I, I, I tease, but I'm never. You know, you try. I try to find that nice level for that. You know, what I'm saying where I don't don't stress them out. I want it to be good, good light fun. I don't want to like really come down on somebody and the the better i know you and the more friendly we are the more i will come at you with that kind of thing you know what yes I'm saying? You know, yes I, I, I do yeah i have old friends who i'm sworn enemies across the dm screen with i love them but like <laughs> you know they'll just make you crazy sometimes and um you know uh you know so you know like i won't say that i i change my game up a little any and such until once I see them start changing their game against me, I'm thinking about one person specifically, um, <laughs> Lane Waldrop, my fellow designer and such. And like, he knows my style inside and out. He'll, he'll like call me on the table. Ah, he's faking that. That's a, no, no, no. I know what he's doing right now. He's trying to get in your head. Don't worry about it. Like, Jim, Jim Wampler does that to me in the, in the online game. He's, he's like, that's one of his tells, uh, you know, he, describing it literally as tells. And so far, yeah. I don't think he's been right actually, but <laughs> Well, good. Keep them guessing. Even if you're lying right now, that's perfect. Keep them guessing. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so that, uh, and and I think that uh, the the subsume your ego and fun at the table is the only law is um, applicable not just to convention games, but that's going to be just as applicable, I think, in a long term, sure. long form uh, sure. sort of a game. Because um, regardless of trash talk. Um, I think people do have to trust the DM and that's um, actually, I think that's easier to do in a convention game. 
What do you mean? Well, um, in a in a convention game, people are coming to uh, to play with a, a a DM in a set format, and um, the DM has no real reason, I think, to be the killer DM. Um, so that the I think the expectation there um, is is going to be that the DM really has no reason. Um, yeah, it in it to, to try and and uh, uh, and wipe out the party, as it were. You except, have... except for Tim Cask, I, I, I want to get Tim on here uh, <laughs> talking about it because I think uh, that uh, you know, just like I've been talking about the younger generation, I think that Tim's you know got some uh, yeah. some advice from the generation that's older than ours. He he would be a fine counterpoint to our discussion, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think I think so too. That uh, so, um, and then Tim's uh, if any uh, Tim's channel uh, is curmudgeon in the cellar, and it will be um, over. I think on this side here with the featured channels. So uh, anybody who wants to go and see his his uh, uh, his talks can get a sense of what I'm talking about. I think so. All right, what's uh, what's tip number two? Okay. I'm glad you brought up uh, tells, okay? Because when Jim thought that, said, mentioned that, like I thought of, oh, uh, you know, so um, poker face, okay? It's a good thing to have. But if you're like, I don't really have much of a poker face either. And I, I make a lot of, like, I very often make jokes at the table. I'll be like, okay, I've been working my poker face, guys. Here it goes. No, you don't hear anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, calling attention to it. But what I, because I don't have a good poker face, what I have developed when I'm trying to be tricky, what you do is you use false tells, just like a poker player, okay? So like if I am, you know, if I'm locked in a discussion, I'm looking at you in the face, I'm locked in with you in a thing, and I'm like, you're, you're saying, well, you know, we haven't tried the window. Maybe if, if I know the window is dangerous, okay, and I want to get you to go that way, I'll kind of flip my eyes down on my notes a couple times, like, um, yeah, you could, you could try that if you wanted to, you know? Um, so rather than be like, yeah, you can go for it, you know, like, you know, <laughs> go, go the opposite direction, act a little bit, like sometimes even acting a little bit caught off guard, like, oh yeah, the window, you, you could try the window. Sure. Um, and that's the way if I, especially if I, if I really need to add that kind of a twist moment to a, to a session, if it just needs that, um, I'll sort of act, I'll, I'll try to like surprise them like that. And then I act like it surprises me as well. You go through there, well, oh, well, you open the window and crossbow bolt, a whole, you know, gaggle of them fly in or, or whatever it happens to be, you know? So um, I think developing false tells and the ability to, um, you know, again, if, you, if you're one of those poker face geniuses, I have poker face geniuses in my DM, you know, tree from life, people who I've trained with who are so cool, who you never can read and who you, you could be like, oh my God, how, what do you mean it doesn't work that way? You know, and they're just like, well, you, you tried it and it didn't work and they don't, they don't get hot or they don't, they don't, you know what I mean? Like, I love those kinds of players. I can't, I'm not great at that myself. Um, so I have developed a system of very quick fakes that I can do, you know, um, like here's a good one. You know, when, if, you know, to, to, I'll grab my dice and pick it up and just put it like, just hold it. You know what I'm saying? Like, all uh -huh. right, well, what are you going to, and then they, you know, well, he's got his dice out. Hold on. Let's, and it, it'll make them sort of like refocus for a moment. They, they still might go forward, but maybe it'll give them that little bit of paranoia that will make them either go forward a little more cautiously or go forward with um, more trepidation, you know what I mean? Which I enjoy, you know, like, oh, what are we gonna do? So um, uh, that's it. And I think that really speaks to a larger thing. You know, and you know, um, GMing is a performance, you know what I mean? This is something that you're doing, you know, it, it's, it's an art style, uh, but it, it really is, when you're doing it, I think that, at least for me, I, I really try to think of it in terms of, this is me, putting on a show and trying to entertain the um, people who I'm around and who I'm with and such. And I think that part, any, ask any performer and part of what they do is, you know, you can develop skills, but part, part of it is using what you have, you know? And um, I think realizing what you have, really think like, you know, realizing what are my strengths as a GM? What are my strengths as a, you know, you know, am I good at voices? Am I good at characters? Am I, you know, really tricky? Am I good at describing combat? Um, whatever that is, I think, you know, having that in mind, like, you know, it, it's good to feature the things that you're best at. You know what I mean? It's good to put those front and center. Um, now, if I'm, a, if I'm a DM at home looking at my home campaign, what would you say is more important? Is it to 
play to my strengths or is it to try and develop in the areas where I've got a weakness? Give, oh, if it's okay. a choice. I mean, no, no, why not both answer to this? Sure. Um, I would say your strengths are already your strengths. Your players play your game because they like your strengths. Work on developing your weaknesses. You know, um, your strengths will pretty much take care of themselves. I wouldn't fo focus or concentrate on that. Um, uh, but, but, you know, um, but, uh, you know, like they'll, they'll just, you know, they'll continue to be your strengths, you know, um, and building them up too much. You know, I, I, I've got a DM who I play with, who I really enjoy. He's really great at description, but he just lays that like, he knows he is. So he just does more and more of that every time we play. And after a while you're like, okay, it's been an hour and we haven't done anything, but listen to you talk about how cool the moonlight is or whatever it is. And yeah. sometimes that's great, but sometimes you're not in the mood for that. You know, um, it, it's good to know your strengths and work on your weaknesses. I was how I would put it. Okay. Um, another thing that you said in there that I sort of latched onto, I don't know whether other people did, uh, but you talked about the series of DMS that you trained with. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether that is something that um, is still a concept with, uh, with younger DMs back when you and I started. Um, I would say that there was definitely this concept of I've trained under uh, not exactly a sensei, you know, kind of a thing, but we all usually, most of us learned from somebody else who had the game. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I think that's happening with fifth edition now is, uh, you know, as opposed to other, the, the middle editions, I think a lot of people already played, whereas fifth edition, just like first edition has got this boom going on um, with it. And so tell me about um, the, the sort of DMs that you trained with sure, and, that, and what um, that looked like. Absolutely. So, um, when I, I started off in 1977 with um, where I was a kid and I was playing with a kid my age and he had the game, he had just discovered it. And we, we, we were, you know, it was, a, it was a goof. We didn't do anything, you know what I'm saying? We did nothing like correctly. It was, you know. No, but, me, uh, yeah, no, we, that, that, absolutely. I mean, that, that is yeah. the story of everybody um, who started with a couple of people is we did everything wrong. In my campaign, we decided after about three adventures that we'd earned an experience point and would go up a level. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so but when um, I finally sort of by, I begged and caboodled my way into the big kids game in my neighborhood, I learned uh, at a friend's, um, they were on vacation in California and uh, we went and visited them there. And I learned over this two weeks, we stayed there in California. Um, but when I came back, I found out, found kids in the neighborhood and basically just <laughs> let me be your game so here i am like nine and i'm playing with 15 year olds you know and there was a dm i wish i knew his last name but his name was danny and danny was slick danny was a good storyteller and danny would cut you you know danny did not when it was me and my buddy tommy who we learned with we were real sweet on each other you know what i mean like yeah we would be you know monsters who were cool you would make friends with you could tell if he thought his monster was cool and you'd be like hey blood let's let's be friends and you know you would you know um but uh, Danny was not having any of that. And he, he was like, I really watched his style. I watched how he ran games very, very carefully in the beginning. Um, another one was um, Philip Neer, who was so tricky and so like, he was a, uh, Philip was so amazing. And Philip would get in your brain and he would go like, are you sure it's what you want to do? Right. The, the, he would just yeah. sent you into a spiral. I was probably 11 and 12 when he and I first started playing. We, uh, we met, there was a, a, a game night at my local library. And we met playing there when the two of us got into a total, like a total party, like, you know, this side versus that side brawl against the other guys. And we got killed and went off and had our own game by ourselves. But Phil, Phil was like the first one to really be like psychological, you know what I'm saying? Like, and really like he was, he was playing me and he let me know all the time that it was, you know, it kind of toughened me up. Um, and then um, later on, uh, Don Lafredo, um, he was a great gamer. I played with much later on and such. What he was really good at was world building, describing worlds. And then he would do these great NPCs. Like you would you would want to play that game so you could hang out with the NPCs that he would do. You know what I'm saying? Like you yes. missed the NPCs he had created and you're, you, you in character wanted to spend time with those guys. Um, those, those three guys really developed my style in the, in the early days. And, um, I'm, you know, I, I still talk to Phil every once in a while online. The other guy's not in touch anymore, but, um, 
they made a huge impact on me, and I was definitely um, studying under them. Um, so, you know, um, and I, I still do. I still, you know, I love finding good GMs. I love playing with good GMs. And I'm still to this, you know, I, I think part of it, anything that you really care about, always consider yourself, any skill you want to develop, if you always consider yourself a student, a disciple of, of whatever it is, you know, once you decide you're a master, you stop growing, you know, and I try to never, I, I don't ever want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that's always trying to be better at, you know, at, at, at you know, everything gaming related. Which goes back to the fact that, uh, uh, that it's an art style, that there are, that oh, yeah. there are things to learn. Um, so, um, all right. There, we've also got a question from from Fred Daniel, um, which is that high energy, enthusiasm, and pulling players into the game are strengths I have seen Brendan use to great effect at convention games. He's one of the best at the table I have seen. Now, Fred, since I don't know what um, Brendan's five top DM tips are, um, we're actually I'm actually going to put that aside for the time being, in case Brendan actually stumbles on how to do that later on. So that one, uh, for, for the time being, we're going to put a pin in it. And then if it's not one of his tips, um, then I'm going to hit him with it, uh, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. So um, what's, what's DM tip number three, unless you have anything more to say about the poker vase, uh, versus the false tells. No, no, I do not. But I will, um, I can work, um, Fred's question into this thing because this kind of fits in with my third point, um, which is, to develop your GM style, but you keep your GM, keep your style fluid. And I think, okay, again, this is specifically as a convention gamer, um, you keep your style fluid because for the maximum amount of fun for yourself and your players, I think you want to adjust your style to your players at the table. Which How many players do you usually have at a table? Um, I mean, say usually six or seven. Um, but, uh, you know, goodness knows sometimes I, you know, I've had plenty of conventions with, with fewer. And I mean, I've run huge games out there for, you know, 20 and more people and such where you're just bobbing and weaving and running around the whole time and such. Um, so my style, I play a high energy style, you know, um, I, I definitely do that. And I try to, um, Val says my, my, um, my buddy Val my arch enemy who level. Um, she says that, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm good at is getting everybody involved early on. And I try to do that by, that's a part of my style is getting everybody like, you know, pumped from the beginning, get trying to, you know, I, I try to, um, ah, you know what I'm, you know, I'm skipping ahead, but um, I try to, uh, you know, you know, play that kind of high energy thing and such. But I also realize it's not always appropriate. And sometimes I will get a table full of people who are, clearly weirded out and I'll tone it down a little bit. And, um, I can, I can, you know, since I'm not, I try not to be married to my style. If you're married to your style, when you have, if you feel like you have to change it up, you get frustrated with who you're dealing with and such. I don't want to do that. I, I feel like people are coming to my game. They want to have a good time. And if, if clearly something is I'm doing is, you know, whatever is, 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 you know, not working for them, I'll try to change it on the fly at the table and make it more palatable for everybody involved. Okay, let me break in there because you said that you, I, I think you said that you try to be married to your style. It was what you meant to no. say that you try not to be. I try to be not married to my style. Okay. All I right. try to, um, uh, I try to, like I said, like, to keep, keep on developing it, but not, you know, not feel like, like, you know, I, I don't think that I have the greatest DM style out there. You know what I mean? I think it's a bad way to think about things. Um, I'd rather think of it from point of view of it's something that I'm always trying to get better at. And again, using what I, using what I naturally bring to storytelling, um, I try to develop it and get it, you know, bigger and better, but I also don't want to be like, I don't want to, you know, get where I can only do it my way. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, I want to be able to grow and change and I want to be able to, you know, keep, keeping flexible like that helps you, I think, be a better GM. I think that, you know, you, you sort of, you know, find new stuff, find new ways to tell stories through that. If you don't get, you know, if you're not obsessed about one kind of, and that means GM style, that means design style, you know, um, what I'm, what, what I'm choosing to run at, you know, I try to change up the kinds of adventures that I run as well. Um, and yeah, and one way I practice that is by reacting to my table. You know, sometimes I, I we did MomoCon, um, 
uh, I did Momocon uh, 2017, and I had a table of 13 and 14 year old youngsters who were learning for the first time, and they were slapstick and silly, and they both they mostly wanted to interact with each other. And at first, it was like, guys, I wrote this adventure. Come on! And I'm like, I had to be like, all right, no, check that. They're having fun. So let's just, what can you do to enhance this fun? So I played the sidekicks. I had things going on in the background. They eventually, in their own time, got involved with aspects of the adventure that I had written. But a lot of it they spent just being in character and having a laugh and, you know, you know, you know, just uh, role playing with each other. And uh, they had a perfectly wonderful afternoon game. And uh, I didn't try to force them to not do it their way. So. Now, uh, Victor Takev has a question, and it is one that I was going to come back to as well. And his question is, what do you do with a table with introverts and extroverts? And that's why I asked how many players you generally have at your table. Sure. Because the more players you have at the table, the less and less you have an overall feel. And the more and more you have to focus on individuals and how they are playing. So um, why don't you take it with Victor's form of the question of what do you do when you've got a table with both introverts and extroverts? Sure. Um, I try to manage the extroverts and engage the introverts. Okay. So the, the extroverts, you know, I love playing with extroverts, but they can run over other players. You know what I'm saying? So you want to make it where they're doing their thing. Uh, but they're not like dominating all the time. You know what I mean? You, you gotta, you have to engage them some. You have to let, give them their stage time, but you can't let them ruin it for everybody else. And then for introverts, I try to find some way to make a path to them to like, you know, um, you know, to to get them more engaged and such. Um, as, and as long as I don't see them feeling, I, I will do that. I try to do that gently so I don't stress them out. I know sometimes I can be like a like a you know wrecking ball in that case. So I have to, if I see someone who seems nervous, I'll do something like, like make a small gesture. You know what I mean? I'll, you know, I'll have the NPC look over to you and be like, look, you look like a reasonable guy. Am I wrong about this? You know, obviously I'm not wrong about this. Or, um, you know, uh, like if, if something comes up in the atmosphere of, let's say a dungeon room and such that their character would have specific knowledge about, I'll say, okay, so, you know, player X, your character, you've got mining in your background. As you look around here, you realize all of this stone that you see is not native to any of this region. It all looks different to you and such. You know, just little things like that, kind of softball it to them, but try to reach out to them and give them, if they were, because a lot of times your introverts, they, they're obviously there to play a game. They just don't know when, they have a hard time, I think, you know, knowing when to jump in and when to, you know, when to, um, when to not jump, you know what I mean? They, they don't they don't naturally know when to do that and such. So sometimes giving them a little bit of a platform will get them to engage more. And um, but you know all of that stuff is you know it's all individual. I mean that's that's broad strokes. It's all individual, and you have to kind of do it gently, and you have to do it um, with the what I'm trying to say. Um, you have to do it you know tailor it to the to the specific people you know um, involved. You know, and, um, uh, you know, the 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 best way to get to get good at, you know, running any kind of game is to run it 10,000, 100,000, 100 million times. You know what I'm saying? The more you the more games you run, the better you'll do at it. And some of that just comes after. Lots oh, wait, of do you mean do you mean running the scenario over again or just running convention games over again? I mean, well, you know, there are merits in both things. I meant I was specifically there saying just running a lot, running a lot of adventures for mixed groups of people, you know? Um, I know a lot of people who are great GMs, but they pretty much only run for the same six, seven, or eight people every week, you know? Um, they're really good, but um, if they wanted to really, if they were asking me, how could I improve my skills? I would say, go to the con and play with strangers. You know what I mean? And, you know, you know, see how they react to it. But it's a, it's a process, and it could be a very long process, you know? I've been doing the convention circuit pretty, like, you know, I started really doing it in 2000 and say, say 2000 flat. And then um, every year I've added more and more shows, you know. So I, like last year, I think I did 17 conventions. You know? Oh, my and gosh. Running. I do three. <laughs> and I'm and three's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> and I had uh, – oh, actually, no, I can't uh, – 
I can't tell you the thing that absolutely uh, wowed me uh, with somebody because that interview is recorded and is going to be next Thursday's interview. So uh, everybody stay tuned for another thing uh, that, that, uh, uh, that vastly surprised me. So let's go back. You do 17 conventions a year. Uh, I think last year I did 17. I think I'm only doing 16 in 20 in this year coming up, you know, oh, well, um, pull it, pull it back. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and some of those, you know, some of those are trade shows and the trade shows are a little bit different, you know, like, um, I do trade shows where it's just retailers come. So I'll, I, you know, I run demos for two days long, you know what I mean? And I run like, you know, rather than four hour sessions, I run, you know, God only knows how many 15 minute demos at our booth or at the little open gaming area, you know, it just kind of depends. Okay. Um, let me take a look real quick through my questions um, here and see whether I have anything else that I wanted to hit on this particular point. And I don't really think so. So let's go to your top DM tip number four. Okay. Uh, top GM tip number four. Okay, so um, last night you guys were talking about, um, you know, some GMs are really good at doing characters at the table and voices, and some have, uh, it's more challenging for other GMs, you know? Um, so I have a shortcut if it's, you know, wherever wh wherever you are with it, I have a shortcut. And um, the shortcut that I use is that, number four, um, shortcut to good characterizations I borrow from TV, movies, and most importantly, audiobooks. Um, audiobook narrators are the best. You know what I mean? Like one, you know, you know, like a really good one, like Jim Dale. You know what I'm saying? Like who, you know, who does 55 characters that are so distinct that all he has to do is speak a few words in that character's, um, you know, you know, voice, and you know exactly who's speaking at that individual thing. You know. Um, or Lee Horsley, who I love, um, old cowboy actor who does uh, like Lonesome Dove and a couple other ones, you know what I'm saying, who's uh -huh. just magnificent, you know. Um, listen to the, like, the, listen to the really good, George Woodall, um, uh, listen to the really good audiobook um, guys and, um, you know, just, uh, <laughs> uh, just, you know, see how they do it. And um, I, I very often, I copy wholesale characters from this. Lee Horsley specifically, I ran a very long running Back when I ran a home, long home cam campaigns, I ran a very long running Deadlands campaign, um, say early 2000s or mid 2000s, I guess. And um, oh, almost all, I used so many voices and accents and manner, vo vocal mannerisms that I got completely from the Lonesome Dove audiobook, you know, and just, you know, which I, I, I love that story. I love that performance. And I would just wholesale borrow them, you know. I mean, you're not, you know, I think, you know, you're not putting it up for sale, you know what I mean? I think it's completely okay for, in the context of a game to say, okay, I'm gonna make this character sound like this actor or this character from a movie or this audiobook narrator doing this specific guy. That's a, a great and easy shortcut. And I'll go so far, when I'm getting used to a game, I'll go so far as to actually write down the actor or the character that I, um, that I, ha that I have in mind next to that NPC's name. If it comes up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, eventually you get off book and you can just do them, you know, but um, that's been huge to me. And it's actually one of the short, a very good shortcut to role playing. Um, when uh, in my, in my game, X crawl, I, every time we get, go, you know, we get going, I tell them, uh, come up with, you need a team name, you need a name for your character, you know, like. A, a... All right. looks like Brendan may have frozen temporarily. And so hopefully he will hit the link again and be back on the show. And so we'll wait for a moment and see whether he comes back in. Um, okay, there he goes. We'll see whether he comes back in. <laughs> I would love to get more questions um, from the chat room. And also um, the 30 or so of you hit like on the video uh, at this point in time because you've been on it long enough uh, to know that you that you like it. So hit uh hit like and we do have brendan's uh picture back up again so hopefully he'll be uh, back in touch um i know right <laughs> just trying to log back in we've got the comments from the chat room there we are my back yep you're back all right I'll keep, stand. keep going you're talking about taking um characters um oh. direct from audiobooks and using Great. them 
for uh, for NPCs that, that the characters meet. Yes. And in X crawl specifically, I have everyone record on somewhere on their character sheet. I, I asked them, what actor will be playing your character in the movie they make of this adventure? And that is a nice. really good shortcut. That's to roll. neat. Yeah, it works like a charm. Um, I actually worked into the rule book of the original X crawl or uh, the Pathfinder version, and uh, I, I, it's the it's the fastest way to get people to engage with their character I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Thank that's you. brilliant. Thank you. I'm writing it down, so you have to talk because, <laughs> because I'm writing it down. I think no, you're uh, typing. You're typing on the side, but I am doing longhand writing. So <laughs> it takes me a little bit longer uh, to write down and ask them what actor is going to play their character. Yeah, I think it's really helpful. All right. So um, that's uh, that's number four. What else about number four? Um, you said audio books, what yeah, other and, and movies, you know, you know, see how, you know, I mean, it's good to watch things about actors, specifically, um, what we do improv actors. Um, it's good to watch them, how they do it and such. Um, there's a book, if I could recommend, um, there's a great book called yes. End, which is about applying. It's specifically about applying the principles of, um, improv uh, were improv acting to your general thought and the business and whatnot, but getting those things down, you know, I mean, everyone talks about as a GM, yes. And, and how important it is to say yes. And then add to something, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, watch how improvers do it. Like, you know, try it out, you know, try it with your friends, just do a little bit of, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of character work. You know, I did improv in high school and then I, had this, that performance when I was coming up and it, it absolutely was invaluable to developing that skill. Um, and I recommend doing it very highly. Awesome. All right. Let's go to DM tip number five. I'm, ch I'm checking my watch now and we're at the 640 mark and normally we go for about an hour. So we're yeah. just about uh, on, on schedule for this. So what is DM tip number five? All right. Number five, and this I think is the most important one. Um, I left it to last, and um, you guys have touched on it. I think any good discussion about DMing touches on this. Um, um, anticipate your game going off the rails and work on your off the rail gaming skills. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, you know, you just, I don't care who you are, you know, how careful, how crafty, how interesting a designer you are at some point your characters are going to do something wacky and rather than try to shut them down, celebrate that. That's where the game begins. That's where it really gets fun and interesting, you know? Um, and I think there's a, a couple of different things to keep in mind when you do that. And one is don't be real precious about your adventure. You know what I mean? You know, the, the adventure is there to be a guideline. You designed it or you, you're running it out of a book. Even if you love it, 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 you know, if it goes off the rails at the table, the, adventure that you designed and created is still there you know what i mean it doesn't go it doesn't doesn't get erased or changed by a table full of people who are really going nuts with it and doing something really you know uh you know really taking it into um you know uh a, a different you know a, a different position um but um it's but learning that i think like learning how to do that and how to just love that when it gets that way it's tricky you know, there are techniques you can use. You know what, what I'm saying? Are, what are those? That's because I've been wondering the whole time that you've been talking and you, you said develop uh, your off the rail skills. What are off the rail skills and how do you develop them? Um, have it happen to you 8,000 times is how you develop them, but also discuss them with your other dungeon masters and see how they do it. You know, I mean, I have I've had long winding conversations with a lot of DMs who I really respect about how to deal with this kind of thing specifically, you know? Um, but one of, to me, the key skill to that is visualization, you know? Um, really visualize what your dungeon looks like. What does it look like? Okay, so imagine that we're talking, this dungeon I'm running is a tower, okay? And I've constructed a tower. They go in the front door. There's a clue. Then they go higher. There's a monster. There's a trap. There's a riddle. There's another monster. There's a hazard. And then there's a big monster, okay? Okay. Um, that's fine. Uh, you know, you, you know, maybe they'll go through and do all of that, or maybe they'll get to the tower and very reasonably say, okay, well, we're going to walk a perimeter around the entire outside of the tower and take a look and see what we see. You 
need to have already thought about what that looks like. You know, take a go on a virtual tour of your dun tour of your dungeon in your mind and see what all is there for you to see. You know, look out into the you know you know at least be able to just to look out and say, okay, you walk around the back of the tower and you see that the hills roll away back into you know deep forest all the way and far far away you know you see smoke coming from somewhere you don't know what's going on over there. But you know those little <laughs> deer they're going to go find out what the smoke's all about and then you're way off the rails there <laughs> it's fine you know why because you know when they get there put something there interesting and if you know for a, for a convention thing have there be some way that it re you know that it reflects back on to the main adventure you know um so here's you know skill number whatever we're up to as far as that goes five this is our last one unless you have more no but i mean as far as um like your your off the rail skills how oh, no, off the rails because you're still on number one on off the rail skills. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, definitely visualize. Uh, number two is, um, you know, you guys touched on this last night, okay? Um, and uh, you guys were talking about how, like, is it fair to, you could talk about the quantum ogre, where if I have three hallways and the ogre can appear A, B, and C, or wherever and such, is that actually fair? It's fair if your goal is to give everybody a really good time. And to put, you know, so at a certain point in your story, you need to have an action beat. So if my guys go, we see a fire out in the forest, they head over there. What, you know, suddenly, you know, they, they make it there. And now we're one hour into a four hour convention session and they've done nothing but make it from town to the tower, through the woods and to the campfire that I've now established is out there. So at this point, you know, you've got a full hour, a four hour game with nothing for the fighter to do. He's not having a good time. Right. So, um, I've, I have no problem either taking one of those encounters that I had set up for my imaginary tower and moving it out there or having, you know, even even reskinning it. You know, OK, it was going to be three ogres and they were going to have this much. Now they're three super tough bandits and they're, you know, going to be over there or whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, you know, give them something to do in that moment. Don't let them just wander around off the edge of your map and just be like, well, there's nothing here. So you don't see anything, put things there. And if that means borrowing from later on in your dungeon and adding it to your dungeon earlier, um, go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, go ahead and uh, add it there and then, you know, add something different when they get there. It's we're, also good we're to have laughing. A I, we're laughing, I think, at Jim Wampler's post that the smoke's a failed teleport of a PC <laughs> wizard uh, from the tower who left a smoky scroll you could still use. It's, it's de <laughs> derailing the attention of everybody who's uh, who's on the show. Thank you so much, Jim. He's trying to make sure that his his show from earlier is the better show, I think, is what's going on there. Um. All right, so that's tip number two: is that um, the quantum ogre is fair if the goal is fun. Um, and yes. uh, uh, so, what uh, do you, do you agree with that in terms of a home game that's a campaign game as well? One hundred percent. Yes. Okay. Um, for a long time, I ran a uh, but you know I read about a sandbox game. I heard that term for the first time and I was intrigued. So I read everything I could about sandbox games and I told my players, "Hey guys, I'm going to start a new game next week. It's going to be my sandbox game." You know, and I right. quickly realized that they were just going to die or not have fun if I literally gave them a blank map and with like encounter A, B, C, and D. You know, um, so. When I ran, I said it was a sandbox. And this is like last night, somebody said, um, or last night, when in your interview with Wampler, someone was like, this account is, uh, you know, is still cheating if they don't know that you're doing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I ran, and I would never say this to them, I ran a simulated sandbox. You know, I had encounters set up. And if they decided, okay, today we're going to go north and east and west. Well, it turns out that's where the thing was. And I would physically add it to my map, you know, once they were. You know, they went north, and they found the the huge skeleton of the ancient dinosaur that now the, you know, the savage men were all worshiping. If they had gone South, it would have been in the South. You know, it, it, you know, as long as you, here's the thing. The only thing that matters is with that is that once you put it in a place, you have to be consistent. Take now, notes, take notes. Oh, isn't take it? good notes. Yeah. 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 Now that it's in, especially for that game, now that it's in the South, that's where it is and no backsies, you know, and even if you make a mistake and they get something too powerful or they get a clue too early, stick with it and roll with it. And another skill to that, to the, to the um, off the rail skills, 
don't get mad at yourself for mistakes. If you drop a ball, make it look like part of the act and just keep rolling. You know, um, don't be, you know, and I never let them see behind the curtain. I'm never like, oh, okay. Um, all right. Well, I guess you do something else then. Uh, I don't do that. And just be cool. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Fake it if you must, but be cool. And then, um, uh, you know, and then move on from there and just, you know, like, um, you know, uh, you know, like just, you know, keep going from that point that you're at without feeling bad that, something has happened off the rail and go with it. Right. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions from the chat room that, uh, that I wanted to bring in. Um, uh, Fred Daniel has asked one, but let me, I want to scroll back up just a second because we had a question. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Just, uh, thinking here thinking here okay uh victor has asked what do you do when your players have problems with the visualization this is going back to uh the 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 off the rail skills and visualization um you know i mean if, if if your player has a hard time seeing it the way that you do you know i i i work with my hands a lot and um i'll i'll try to like i'll use my hands to kind of set things or can, I'm going to stand up and stand back behind myself and talk very loudly for a moment, okay? Okay. So what I might do is – oh, you can't even see me. No, just leave it where it was. It's fine. Gotcha. So what I might do is I might say if they're having a hard time, I'll really go strong with my hands and say, okay, so you see the box is ahead of you, okay? It's about this big and about this much. And when you touch it, it feels slick. But then there on the bottom, you know, you think there might be some kind of wire along the bottom and such. Um, now, as you look off around the room, every direction you see about 30 feet away, you know, I, I do that. I kind of act like a tour, physical tour guide to it. And um, <laughs> that, that hurts me in running online games, uh, I have learned recently. But um, that is a way to um, visualize the uh, – that, that helps me help people visualize things, is using my hands to describe it as best as I can. Yeah, that's actually one of the things that I do at convention games too. Um, and you're right. When you're suddenly doing an online game and you don't have that skill, uh, yeah. the, that's sort of like you know when you step off a curb when you don't expect to and you do this sort of jump like this. It's, uh, uh, it, it's definitely uh, because there's nothing – I mean, have you got a substitute for that in an online game? Because I, I don't. I've just <laughs> gone yet back. I don't, but yeah. I'm working on it. Um, I would say if I was stuck that way, I might try to, uh, you know, the, the, okay. If I was a really good artist, okay. Um, I have had DMS who work at the table who were very good at like quick sketching a thing and like being like, it looks like this. And you're like, holy crap. That's amazing. You know, I yeah. can't do that. I don't have that kind of skills. And I, I, it would take so long to get good at art. I would die before I got good at art. Um, but I might. I don't know, you know, I might look around on the web real quick and find a picture that kind of looks like what I'm saying and then send it to everybody. I'm like, okay, it looks kind of like this. Um, you know, I uh, I did a web comic for a while with a guy and when, if he wanted to draw the interior of a van, he would do a Google search, interior of a van, quickly find a picture that worked for him and then he would draw that, you know. Um, I would, you know, you use the technology, if you, you know, since technology is the problem, use technology to try to solve it and, uh I would try to do it that way to start off with, you know, um, and if it was a continuing problem, I would have those visuals pre-stocked before I sat down. You know what I'm saying? Even though I was just, bar you know, we're talking about an online game just between friends here. You know, obviously you can't do that for publication, but I'll definitely, you know, borrow bits and bobs from other things to, to show people visual stuff um, while the, um, you know, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it happens to be, an amulet. Uh, what a, a certain animal looks like, you know, the, you know, the interior of a spacious castle, you know? Yeah. So um, to draw together also, you've, uh, um, you've mentioned taking um, the, the persona of actors to be the NPCs and now using the art. And when I first started out as an attorney, um, the guy that I worked for said the, the key to drafting documents is to steal shamelessly. <laughs> Can you do that in law though? 
you can st yeah i mean the paragraphs of a document you know you can you can use something that's been yeah. done by another firm and what he was trying to get across was don't write your own contract from scratch go to other contracts and take the the paragraphs from it and so you're giving dms uh, a very similar piece of advice of steal sure. shamelessly no absolutely absolutely you know um you know the 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 thing to do, I think, is to try to steal obscurely, make it where it's hard for them to figure out, you know, where where you're poaching things from. You know, if it's like, okay, that's obviously from the Avengers, another guy from the Avengers. Clearly, you're doing dude from the Avengers. You know, eventually they're going to be like, okay, you've seen one movie, but um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But draw from that old stuff, draw from the obscure bits, you know. Um, now, Fred Daniel asked a question also, and I want to swing over to that one because it's an interesting Go Fred one. Daniel. Um, he says, what would you do with a player that thinks it's fun to just do uh, totally random, senseless stuff just to see what the referee is going to do? In a home game, I would try to never play with that player ever again. Life is too short to be with the, there's a kind of guy that, um, I don't know what the rules are here, but there's a kind of guy that just wants to screw with you. I don't understand gaming with a guy who just wants to screw with you, and I don't understand hanging out with a guy that just wants to screw with you. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, it comes up in a convention sometimes a lot. <sighs> you know, all you can do is manage it, and then if he's really going off the rails, you know, dungeons are dangerous places. That's right. That's what I would do. <laughs> there's, there's things around corners, you know. Um, but I, I, I get personally offended when there's somebody who's obviously like, it's such a selfish act to be like, well, I'm just going to sit here and, you know, I had a guy in a play test one time run around, like run around and, um, Ooh, Jeff Burns has a great question. I want to answer. Um, I've had in a play test, I had a guy run around and just like bang on all the doors. Cause he just felt like being a jackass just then, you know, yeah. beer was involved. And, you know, at some point you just have to kill all those guys. Uh, with extreme prejudice and move on with your life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And although what happens, here's an, here's an interesting question. Cause I was uh, gaming with somebody that for a little bit, I thought that's what he was doing. He kept running forward um, into advanced areas of the dungeon without the rest of the characters with him. And I was getting really pissed off at this until I remembered that at the beginning of the session, I had said this area has not been, you know, parts of this area have been explored and deeper in there are areas that have not been explored that are going to have richer treasure and so forth. And I realized that what he was doing was pulling the party forward into the areas that had not been uh, explored. Now, unfortunately, what he wasn't doing was telling anyone that that's what yeah. he was doing. But, you know. Yeah, that's, you know. That's uh, you'd kill him. I mean, you know, certain no, he would kill himself in my crazy dungeon. You know what I'm saying? Like I wouldn't. I'm not trying to kill anybody. You know what I'm saying? I I am a I'm a very cool GM. I'm a very neutral GM. But as a designer, I'm the devil. You know what I mean? So that's the the juxtaposition I try to create is where I create this funhouse full of all kinds of awful stuff. You know, but um, I, you know, I don't. I never try to kill anybody, but if you run ahead deeper into the dungeon without saying a word to your party members, eventually, you know, it's going to get ugly. Yeah. The, the, so, Le you, the, you, so Leroy Jenkins basically is that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, here's the thing too. Sometimes someone will be like, well, wait a minute. My character is just like that. That's, my character rushes ahead. He's bold. He, he won't wait on anybody else. Well, if that's the case, then you owe it to that guy to really show the story of what happens to characters like that, which is sometimes they get in over their head. And if he survives it, that's awesome. And if not, that is a thing that happened because of that character's specific you know, compilation of traits and backgrounds and how he acted. Nothing for it. You know. Right. But if you don't do it, if you decide, well, he's I'll just let it work out, you are gonna snap him out of your adventure and he is not gonna be having fun anymore. If he runs forward like an idiot and there's zero consequences to it, then your dungeon's just sitting around. It's what are you doing? You know? Right. All right. Now we can answer Jeff's question um, that you got excited about before, which is does system matter? Okay, so um system absolutely matters. And the system that you use absolutely changes the kinds of stories that you can tell. 
Um, and it, it will absolutely change. You, you can't like, you know, obviously there are some systems that are pretty close to one another and it wouldn't matter all that much. But like as someone who has designed in 3.0 and Pathfinder and DCC and MCC, um, what, you know, the, the, the rules, you know, to a large degree will dictate the kind of stories you can tell, you know? Um, I, I like playing 5e. I've never run it and I haven't designed it, but I like playing it. But there are some kind of stories that you can't tell in a world where you heal all your hit points overnight. Right. You know? All right. Now we've got another question from Danger Esque, which is most of my group wants, uh, most of my group wants to play just to hang out, so the games are lighthearted. However, one wants to play more serious and be more hardcore with mechanics. How can I find a balance as GM? That's a tough, tough that is question. Tough. It's really tough. I've been sort of noodling on that one um, yeah. the whole time. Um, you know, uh, at some point, you know, you can nudge them towards the kind of play style that you want to do. But if they're doing what they want to do, you know, I mean, there there are groups that I have abandoned because either they were so intense that feelings were getting hurt and people were uncomfortable and I stopped having fun, or they were so like eh, hanging out and you know. You know, like it was just like, really, it was just a four-hour bull session with pizza. And but the, uh, but the question is, what happens when you've got some of each in the group? Oh, in an individual group, you got to have a discussion at some point. I mean, you can try to, at, you know, at some point, I think if it's, you know, you'll get to an impasse. I, you know, obviously, if you can work that out in game, that's very, very tricky to do. But you can sometimes, and I think that, like, you know, sometimes those you know light-hearted players can be enticed into light in a in a light-hearted fashion doing really intense things you know what i'm saying but still having fun with it and sometimes those guys who will just want to play super intense you know you can kind of gentle them into you know being part of the overall mix of the group it's very tricky but you can do it um but sometimes you can't and it, 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 i'm definitely you know, a fan of sometimes, and I usually, I want to do it by email so everyone doesn't throw dice at each other, but like, you know, after a couple of sessions where I saw that was becoming an irre irreconcilable difference at the table, I might have to sit back and be like, okay, we're seeing a clash of styles here. Let's talk about this. You know, d discuss these things, you know, um, you know, these are all, especially in a, in a home group, well, <laughs> at least as far as I remember how home groups went, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, weren't those good days. Um, but. Uh, uh, I, you know, I would say these are people you, you're friends with and you like, um, talk and work it out. And it might get to where, you know, what do you do when you have, you know, th I'm trying to say, uh, there are people whose styles, whose gaming styles I am simply incompatible with and vice versa. And in those cases, I mean, you know, not every game is going to be the most fun. If, if, if fun at the table is the most important thing, obviously sometimes you get a mix at a convention table and you just kind of get through four hours. But, um, you know, in a, in a long term thing, even with good friends, sometimes there are the, there are, you know, you know, uh, there are people who come who really want to role play. There are people who want to come who just want to whack monsters. Yeah, that was that was actually the the distinction um, that I was thinking of uh, when Dangerous posted the one about mechanics versus lighthearted. Those are two uh, different things. But the one I run into more often is the role play versus beer and pretzels thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and you know, like I said, you, you can work on managing that. You can talk to the beer guys and you'd be like, hey, how about you just bring three instead of six and you slow down a little bit. And you can talk to your other guys and be like, hey, look, how about, you know, could you lighten up a little bit, and maybe get with the flow of it? And if not, sometimes those groups don't work out anymore. And that sucks. But the thing to do is to communicate about it before you just say, screw this and walk away. You know, um, it's a relationship. You know, you're like a theater troupe at some point, and theater troops go through these things where they have to decide what play they want to play, what roles they want to play, and where they want to play. And, um, you know, goodness knows there are groups that, like I said, I, I can't play with somebody who's, there's, like I said, the kind of player who is just wants to screw with you. I, 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 I got no time for that. You know what I mean? My, you know, life is too short to, to go four hours with a guy who's just out to make me look bad or make me have a bad time. You know what I'm saying? I, I don't oh, understand yeah. the mindset. So I, I, at some point I'm like, I, I can't do that game anymore. So. Right. All right. We will take one more question. Um, sure. We've got, uh, it's Fred Daniel again, and is asking what uh, tricks do you have to get individual PCs to feel like they're a bonded party of adventurers? 
Sure. With, um, which with a convention game is fairly easy because you just tell them. Yeah, but you know what though? Just telling them isn't, you know, is it some that will work with really good players. There are some players you guys say, okay, you know, Nick and knock the doors. You guys have been adventuring together for 10 years. That's all you have to tell those folks, you know, but some players have a harder time with that. And um, what I might do, okay, imagine Nick and knock. Okay. Um, I might say uh, if, if Nick goes over, he walks into the tavern and is like, Oh, I want to get a beer. You know, I might turn to the player who's playing knock and be like, okay, you know, knock, you've been hanging out with Nick for a whole lot of times. You know, if he starts drinking, he's going to keep drinking and eventually it's going to be a bar fight. And you give them that little bit of their history, and then suddenly they've got like a little conflict that they can have a little bit of dialogue or role play over or, or whatever it happens to be. You just don't want to give anybody something either so specific or so gross, you know, oh, Nick, Nick's going for a beer. Oh, knock, you know that the last time you went and got a beer, he killed your sister. You know, like that's, you know, you don't do it like that. You know what I mean? Right. You do it right and you make it fun. Um, and uh, you know, you know, you know, give them little, you know, specifically small little instances that they can then play up in a bigger things. And I think it's better than just telling people, you know, you guys have been friends forever. Sometimes it's the best you can do. But you know, as the thing progresses, if they're not gelling, um, throw in those little details in the character background you know, and make them canon. Once you say that, oh, well, you know, the two of you guys used to work on a fishing boat and uh, you were always trying in a rivalry to see who could catch the most fish. You know what I mean? Watch those players, a little detail, you know, a lot of players will just grab that, pick it up and run with it. And suddenly they're trying to see who can kill the most orcs, who can find the most traps, whatever it happens to be, and they'll bond over it. So yeah. little details. Absolutely. All right, so we've hit um, the seven o'clock point and I don't want to um wear brendan out we will do i th i think that you've got enough people uh coming onto the show who want to ask general questions about dming that i think maybe we ought to schedule uh a, a show f just for that at some point in the in the future just for just for talk what? yeah just taking questions from people oh yeah 100 percent i'm sure all right. All right. Very good. Well, thank you, everybody. Say goodbye to your fans, Brendan. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. And uh, and I will say to everybody out there, no matter what kind of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.